I mentioned the Proud Boys. Um, there is a new uh, indictment of a number of Proud Boys, including their uh, former chairman, Enrique Tarrio. Uh, so it's Enrique Tarrio, f- former chairman, four other members of the far right group were indicted on Monday for seditious conspiracy for their roles in the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. Let's go ahead and put this first element up there on the screen. Um, This is one of the most serious criminal charges to be brought in the Justice Department's sprawling investigation of the assault, they say. They say this came in an amended indictment that was unsealed in federal district court in Washington. The men had already been charged in an earlier indictment filed in March with conspiring to obstruct the certification of the 2020 presidential election. So this is a superseding indictment. This marks the second time that a group has been charged with seditious conspiracy in connection with the January 6th attack. Uh, In January, Stuart Rhodes, the leader and founder of the far-right Oath Keepers Militia, was arrested and charged along with 10 others with the same crime. The charge of seditious conspiracy, they say, can be difficult to prove, carries particular particular legal weight as well as political overtones, and it requires prosecutors to show that at least two people agreed to use force to overthrow government authority or delay the execution of a U.S. law, carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. Yeah. Um, I read through this indictment. Yep. Um, you know, maybe the government has additional facts and information than what was in this indictment, so I'm going to leave that possibility open. It's very hard when you read these things to uh, determine, to sort out what is just like self-aggrandizing LARPing mm-hmm. and what is actual like you know, actionable plans to execute some uh, insurrection and overthrow of the government. So it is sort of similar to the Oath Keepers indictment that I also read. There's a lot of social media chatter about this is 1776 and storming the Winter Palace and all this kind of rhetoric, right? Yeah. So they're very, you know, they they see themselves in this light or they want to pump themselves up as being uh, this, you know, these revolutionary patriots. Again, the American people had very different feelings about what they were actually trying to, to do that day. Enrique Tario was not in D.C. that day because he had, I don't know if you guys remember this, he had been uh, arrested for burning, stealing and burning a Black Lives Matter flag. So mm. he was banned from the city. Um, but what the government argues is he was like sort of directing events from afar. Uh, part of why the government was able to put this indictment together, I think, was because this documentarian was following them on this day. So they have all kinds of video um, and insight into their actions on that day. Uh, documented at this point, they were some of the first uh, you know, rioters to breach the Capitol. Some of them, you know, directly violent, uh, assaulting people, breaking through metal barricades, those sorts of things. So um, that is ultimately what the indictment says. I have no idea. And I don't honestly think that anybody really knows how likely it is that they end up getting a conviction on this one or the Oath Keepers one. Um, but, you know, it's clear from reading this that both of these groups, they sort of like, you know, they they were high on their own supply. Um, they were uh, wanting to pump themselves up like they were these key players in history. They kept say, you know, telling themselves like we did it and we're, you know, we changed history today and all of this sort of stuff. So, like I said, hard to sort out how much is like social media LARPing and how much of it is like real serious tactical planning with a chance of success in actually doing something. Maybe it doesn't matter whether it has a chance of success. The seriousness of the intent, I guess, is what matters. I don't know. I mean, I do think I think it does matter. Maybe I just looked at it in a different light because I'm from Texas and I grew up with, you know, a lot, frankly, rednecks, let's be honest here, who always had like Confederate buckle bags and were uh, uh, Confederate buckles. And we're always talking about like, oh, we'll rise again. Texas always has the right to go independent. And everybody was like, yeah, whatever, man. You know, it's like one of those things that people just Post on Facebook. Don't try. I live in Virginia now. Everybody's got a "Don't Tread on Me" flag. It's fine. I mean, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's definitely it's LARPing almost in an identitarian perspective. Yeah. Now look, I'm not saying that they didn't riot, but I just want to come back to this. Seditious conspiracy is an extraordinary charge, of which the last time it was prosecuted by the Justice Department, they lost humiliatingly against the Hua Tree Militia, which was a Christian nationalist militia in Michigan. <laughs> Honestly, the uh, circumstances of that are very similar. They had an undercover FBI agent who was like the best man of one of the ringleaders who was in charge and he infiltrated 
infiltrated the group and they had to try and prove that they were literally, this Christian militia was trying to overthrow the government. And they relied entirely on circumstantial evidence, very much in the same way that we have here. So, and this is not just me saying this, there's actual lefty kind of legal analysts who have been yeah. pointed out the problems with ch uh, charging seditious conspiracy. They all got off, all 10 members. And the FBI actually had to return their guns and their AR-15s wow. to them, all of their seized property. So it's that's the last time in the United States of America that a seditious conspiracy charge was filed against a far-right Christian nationalist militia. I'm not saying these are good guys or that they were up to anything good, but the point is that you have an extraordinary burden of proof on the U.S. government in order to try and prove this because it also carries and, an extraordinary sentence. And it, and it should be that way. Yeah. Um, so let me give you a few of the details here um, from news reports also, the way this this is written up. That So they say that while well, the Oath Keepers, the other group that was charged with seditious conspiracy, and they were the ones that after January 6th, they went and celebrated at like, like a Denny's or an yeah. IHOP or something like that. <laughs> I can't remember exactly. As one does in the middle of the revolution. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Everybody celebrates the revolution at Denny's. Um, yeah. The Oath, Oath Keepers had been planning for an armed response to Trump's loss for some time. The Proud Boys appear to have been mobilized around January 6th only after Trump tweeted that there would be a, quote, wild protest in D.C. on that day. According to the government's indictment, Tario and other Proud Boys formed a new chapter of the organization, sort of an elite Proud Boys unit, I guess, on December 20th, called the Ministry of Self-Defense. The focus, Tario said, is, quote, national rally planning. So Trump's tweet about a wild protest was December 19th. They start this group on December 20th. So, you know, the government is trying to indicate, like, Trump really inspired these guys to pull together this sort of like militant armed group and to execute this planning for January 6th. Um, shortly thereafter, they say someone sent Tario a nine page plan titled, quote, 1776 Returns. It included plans for occupying a number of buildings in Washington. In a video chat December 30th, Tario told members of the MOSD that what would happen on January 6th would be, quote, completely different than the group's past demonstrations and wouldn't simply be a a, quote, night march and flexing. So this is some of the evidence the government is laying out to say this wasn't just, you know, Proud Boys, obviously, they're sort of notorious for mm -hmm. being um, mayhem, mischief, make showing up at um, rallies and getting into scuffles and, yeah. um, you know, sort of having like an, an inclination or a, a, a acceptance of violence in their ranks, that there was planning involved, that they actually had these documents that, that lay down a plan to occupy uh, buildings. They have messages between them, you know, plotting out what they're going to do on the day. And so that is the case ultimately that they are laying out. Yeah, and look, I mean, I think that they have a pretty good case for what, like for illegal entry, mischief, you know, maybe even conspiracy to that effect. But again, I just wanna emphasize seditious conspiracy is an extraordinary charge that's being brought. And I honestly do think it's political. I think it's being brought by the Department of Justice in order to try and mollify and satisfy kind of these bloodthirsty Dems who are like, what are we gonna do to try and make sure that these people are held accountable? And Look, I think it exposes a lot of the ways that they think about, you know, criminal justice and kind of how it should be used against people that they look at as, you know, they're fine or they're they're the real criminals and then, you know, our side who does anything similarly. It's like, no, that's not how the law works, nor should it. It should be equal application of the law. And let's throw this final one up there on the screen because I also think that this just goes to show you the Justice Department here is bringing a contempt case against Peter Navarro for not complying with the uh, the uh, not complying with the request of the January 6th committee. Now, is Peter Navarro technically in violation of the law? Yeah, but how many times have we seen contempt charges moved from Congress to the Justice Department and they refuse to actually prosecute it. I mean, it actually doesn't happen all that often for the Justice Department to specifically carry out the contempt charge because a lot of people, and I hate, I hate to say this, a lot of people actually are in contempt of Congress. A lot of people don't simply just comply, but the Justice Department, Merrick Garland's Justice Department is making them the enforcers on the January 6th committee. I'm not saying that they shouldn't comply. It's a legal you know, charge they, they're supposed to, but the application of law, again, shows you what the priority actually yeah, is. Yeah, I don't know. So on this one, I think this dude should be held in contempt. Because, I mean, you can't have a congressional body, whether you're like super into the January 6th committee or not, that 
has the power to compel people to testify, and people can just say, screw you, uh, I'm not just, going to, I don't and just with you at nothing all. happens. I think the charge against him is completely fine. I just wish that everybody who's held in contempt of Congress yeah. actually got prosecuted. That's for that's Congress. fine. There, yeah. But just because it's not, you know, I mean, yeah. it should be consistently applied, but you can't just say, like, eh, we're just not going to get, like, you can just go to Congress and when they, you know, ask sure. you to testify or not. So I think if you're going to have a government and have a state, <laughs> you have to be able to enforce rules like this. So I have no problem with Peter Navarro or Steve Bannon or, you know, if Mark Meadows, who also didn't comply with their request and others, um, being held in com- contempt, I have no problem with Charge that. Charge him, that's completely fine. I'm I'm more saying I know that there is not ap- equal application of the law because I've seen several contempt charges not get brought against other people. And I just think, it. look, I mean, the, the thing that it feeds into is the witch hunt narrative that a lot of people who look at this and are saying, look, you see these January 6th people who are still, where they're still in prison, like a Washington DC jail, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates are like always talking about this. And I, I mean, look, it, it is unjust, but you also see the seditious conspiracy charge of the millions of dollars the Justice Department has spent on this and no real investigation now, millions of dollars spent by Congress, prime time. I just think it feeds into to that narrative. And I do think it delegitimizes actually some of the power of Congress in the eyes of the people. Now, look, I mean, you know, it's got an 8% approval rating. I mean, uh, I pl- believe in the equal application of law, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. And yeah. I mean, this is not people's top day to day priority, but overwhelmingly, the American people were horrified by this day. Uh, and, be. you know, the idea that people who were involved should be appropriately held to account and the existing laws applied to them. I have zero problem Mm -hmm, with that whatsoever. And I do think it's a fake narrative that's been spun about like, you know, the, the, there's, there is a contingent on the right that just wants everybody to be left off the hook and paints them as like, they were just tourists taking Mm -hmm. selfies and no big deal. No, I mean, the, the application of the law here is actually important. You can't just have it where, you know, if you don't like what a congressional body is doing, you can just say, screw you, I'm not gonna show up. Um, and you know, I also don't want to downplay, even as some of these people were buffoonish and some of their, some of their plots, you know, completely ridiculous and had no chance of working. The, uh, they were serious about wanting to do this, wanting to overthrow the government. I do think that that's something we should take seriously. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, and that is why I actually look at people like John Eastman and some of those people who were legitimately legally trying to do this. I'm yeah. like, those are the people you really should be going And after. Eastman. Yeah. yeah. That's a weird one because this is not some, I mean, he obviously is a crank. Right. But he came from this like, you know, sort of intellectual. He's a legitimate lawyer. Background, right. legitimate right. lawyer, all this stuff. And he was very involved in trying to come up with some like high-minded stop mm. the steal. Use exploiting some ambiguities in constitutional language to try to make this thing a reality. And so, I mean, it is troubling to learn that there were people who were sort of engaged in this plotting behind the scenes, again, whether or not it was realistic for it ultimately to be pulled off. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.